So how well muscle performs is dependent upon force and endurance. So force is the maximum amount of tension that is produced by that muscle. And endurance is the amount of time that particular activity can be sustained by those muscles. So force and endurance depends upon the type of muscle fibers and the physical conditioning. So let's look at the types of muscle fibers. And uh, we have three types. We have fast glycolytic fibers that we can abbreviate as FG fibers, also known as fast twitch glycolytic. We have fast oxidative glycolytic fibers or FOG fibers, also known as fast twitch oxidative. Slow oxidative fibers or SO fibers, also known as slow twitch oxidative fibers. So what determines whether or not a muscle fiber is fast versus slow? Well, it all has to do with myosin. So we'll go ahead and redraw the myosin. We have the tail, we have the hinge, and of course we have the head. And uh, we know that we have the actin binding site on the head of myosin, and we also have the ATP binding site. All right, and furthermore, we also know that on that ATP binding site is the enzyme ATPA. So it has a built-in ATPase, and uh, we know that enzyme hydrolyzes ATP, so we end up with ADP plus inorganic phosphate plus energy. All right, so when you say fast twitch, that means that the activity of that ATP enzyme is fast. It hydrolyzes that ATP rather quickly. Now, what if the ATP ACE activity is slow? That means it doesn't hydrolyze ATP all that fast, or it's slower than what we find with fast twitch. So if that's the case, then that muscle fiber is referred to as slow twitch. So once again, whether or not it's fast versus slow is dependent upon how fast that enzyme ATP ACE hydrolyzes ATP. Now, what about glycolytic versus oxidative? So when you see glycolytic, that means it's utilizing anaerobic glycolysis. In other words, lactic acid fermentation. Now, if you see oxidative, then that means it's utilizing aerobic metabolism. In other words, aerobic cell respiration. So let's first look at the first type of skeletal muscle fiber, and that's fast glycolytic fibers, FG fibers. Once again, also known as fast twitch glycolytic. So it utilizes anaerobic metabolism, specifically lactic acid fermentation. So these types of muscles contract very quickly. However, they fatigue very quickly as well. So you really get a lot of power out of that muscle, but it's not sustained, right? So it's a very quick burst of energy, but it's a powerful one. What we find, inside the sarcoplasm of these skeletal muscle fibers is high glycogen reserves. So lots of those polysaccharide glycogen that is essentially the storage form of glucose. We also find relatively few mitochondria and low myoglobin content. So what's the implication of that? Well, what that means is that mitochondria, as you know, is where aerobic cell metabolism or aerobic cell respiration occurs. That's where we get all that ATP from. So the fact that it has few mitochondria should tell you that it doesn't really utilize aerobic cell respiration. And it has a low myoglobin content. So if you remember our discussion of what myoglobin is, it's a protein that binds to oxygen. So the fact that it has low myoglobin content means there's not a lot of it to bind to oxygen. Furthermore, it has pale colored muscle fibers. And the reason for that is because there's not a whole lot of blood capillaries that serve or that supply these fast twitch glycolytic skeletal muscle fibers. So hence, they look paler. They're not as richly vascularized compared to the other two types of skeletal muscle fibers. So I hope it's obvious that between the few mitochondria, the low myoglobin content, and the fact that we, it's not as richly uh, vascularized, there's not a whole lot of blood capillaries that serve these muscles, that anaerobic glycolysis is the way they're going to utilize to get their ATP. So for example, your power lifter, so individuals that are able to lift an enormous amount of weight. Now clearly, obviously, they're able to lift that barbell, that weight, uh, and um, they drop it immediately because again, it's unsustainable, but it's a powerful type of contraction. The next type of skeletal muscle fiber 
are what's called the fast oxidative glycolytic fibers, FOG fibers, also known as fast twitch oxidative. So these types of muscle fibers can utilize both aerobic respiration and anaerobic glycolysis. So once again, folks, remember anaerobic glycolysis means lactic acid fermentation. So these muscles contract quickly. However, they're a little more fatigue resistant uh, compared to the fast twitch glycolytic. So uh, the contraction can be sustained relatively more than the uh, anaerobic glycolysis. We find intermediate glycogen reserves. We find many mitochondria and we also have a high myoglobin content. And obviously that's necessary if this particular skeletal muscle cell is to utilize aerobic cell respiration. Furthermore, their skeletal muscle fibers take on a red pinkish color. They have a relatively higher number of blood capillaries that supply these types of skeletal muscle fibers. So therefore they take on a reddish pinkish color. The last type of skeletal muscle fibers are your slow oxidative fibers, your SO fibers, also known as your slow twitch oxidative. And the type of metabolism that they use is aerobic respiration, all right? So they are slow to contract, but slow to fatigue. So their contraction isn't as powerful as a fast twitch glycolytic, but it's more sustained. So they're fatigue resistant. That means they don't tire out as quickly as the fast twitch glycolytic fibers. Furthermore, they have low glycogen reserves, they have many mitochondria, and high myoglobin content. So therefore, there's going to be a lot more oxygen uh, concentration because of the high myoglobin content, and they are richly vascularized. So lots of blood vessels that provide these uh, slow twitch oxidative skeletal muscle fibers. So therefore, their cells take on a reddish color. So one last thing I want to mention before we move on to the next slide is that your sprinters uh, tend to have more of the fast oxidative glycolytic fibers or your FOG fibers, which again is also referred to as fast twitch oxidative, while your marathon runners tend to have more of the slow oxidative fibers or SO fibers, also known as slow twitch oxidative fibers. So this is a nice cross-section of skeletal muscle. So let's first look at the SO fibers, your slow oxidative fibers, also known as slow twitch oxidative fibers. So take note how much darker they are. So this is the reddish color skeletal muscle. So this is where they utilize uh, aerobic cell respiration and lots of blood vessels supply these types of fibers and hence they take on that deeper burgundy color that you see here. And then we have our FO fibers or FOG fibers, your fast oxidative glycolytic fibers, which we also refer to as your fast twitch oxidative. So these are your intermediate skeletal muscle fibers. And then we have our FG fibers right over here, your fast glycolytic fibers, also known as fast twitch glycolytic. Take note of how much paler they look compared to the other two types of skeletal muscle fibers. So they utilize anaerobic glycolysis, specifically lactic acid fermentation. So this table below is characteristics of skeletal muscle fibers that we just went over. It's a little more detailed than what I care for you to know. So what I'll do is I'll check off the things that I would like you to know. All right. So definitely know the myoglobin content. Don't forget, that's the protein that binds to oxygen and helps concentrate that oxygen in the sarcoplasm. Also know the mitochondria as far as which of these skeletal muscle fibers have more of it or have less of it. I would also like to, you to know the blood capillaries, uh, the fatigue resistance, all right? So how long they can sustain that particular activity. I would like you to know the myosin ATPase activity. That means how fast that enzyme ATPase hydrolyzes ATP. I'd like you to know the glycogen concentration uh, that's found between these three different types of skeletal muscle fibers. 
And one last item that for some reason I did not check off is metabolism. So please include that uh, as what you need to know for this particular table. That means whether the particular type of skeletal muscle utilizes anaerobic uh, glycolysis, lactic acid fermentation, or if it utilizes aerobic metabolism, aerobic cell respiration. So I thought it'd be fun to talk about the chicken. So, so let's draw the chicken. So here's your chicken. And again, I'm not the best illustrator, but we'll do our best, or I'll do my best. All right, so here are the chicken legs. All right, so uh, when we look at the breast of the chicken, we know that it's white, right? That's why often chicken breast is referred to as white meat. And that's because it contains mostly your fast twitch glycolytic fibers. So not really a whole lot of blood vessels relative to the other two types of skeletal muscle fibers supply that area of the chicken, the chicken breast. Now, the chicken legs, commonly known as dark meat, it's because they contain mostly your slow twitch oxidative fibers. Lots of blood vessels supply the muscles of the chicken legs, and therefore it gives that darker color, and hence the dark meat. Now, what about us? We have a mixture of all three. Now, certain individuals, however, will be genetically predisposed to having more of one type versus the other. So for example, certain individuals can build a lot of bulk, right? So when they do weight-bearing exercise, uh, they get really big, their muscles hypertrophy or they increase in size. So they tend to have more of the FG fibers or the fast twitch glycolytic fibers whereas your marathon endurance runners, for example, they're more genetically predisposed to having the SO fibers, the slow twitch oxidative fibers. But generally, most of us have a mixture of all three. Now, speaking of hypertrophy, that means increase in the size of the muscle. And that doesn't happen automatically, obviously. That's gonna happen when you do some type of heavy training or when you do weight-bearing exercise. So when you start to lift weights, then you increase the number of myofibrils, you also increase the number of mitochondria, glycogen reserves increase, and as well as the diameter of the muscle cells. Because obviously, if we're increasing the number of myofibrils, then the diameter of the cell itself will increase, which eventually leads to the increase of the overall muscle. And the lack of exercise is atrophy. So that's what happens when you don't use the muscle anymore. The muscle cells start to break down the myofibrils. Um, the muscle cell itself will decrease in size. We lose muscle tone and we obviously lose the power because obviously the muscle is shrinking. It's decreasing in size. Now we have two different types of atrophy. We have what's called disuse atrophy. Okay, so we're looking at the two different types of atrophy. So we have disuse atrophy, and what that is, is just simply not using that muscle. So you see this, for example, in individuals that have a cast, so or individuals that are bedridden. So because of the fact that they're immobile, or in individuals that have a cast, they can't work out that muscle because obviously the bone is broken. Now, another type of atrophy is called denervation. So denervation atrophy is when the nerve supply is damaged. So those somatic motor neurons are incapable of sending nerve action potential. They're not firing. So therefore, skeletal muscle tissue cannot contract. And that leads to the loss of muscle mass. The muscle literally gets smaller. And we see these with individuals that are paralyzed. Now, when we work out, Ideally, we want to do two different types of activities. One is anaerobic activity, and the other is aerobic. So what's the benefit of anaerobic activity? So you want to think of weight training, right? Lifting weights, for example. So by doing that, this is what's going to lead to the hypertrophy of the muscle. Increase in myofibrils, the size of the cell increases, and then overall the muscle uh, gets bigger, and the muscle becomes more toned. And once again, this is going to involve your mostly fast-twitch glycolytic fibers. Uh, they fatigue quickly, uh, but they are powerful as far as the, the contractions that they produce. So you wanna do those types of activities. The second type of activity that also you wanna do or include in your, your routine is aerobic activity. So this is where you wanna run or jog if you're capable. And uh, what this will do 
is it'll improve your endurance, right? So therefore you're able to run longer. And the benefit of this type of activity is the heart. So you're going to have increased cardiovascular performance. And you'll talk about the cardiovascular system next semester. So that's one of the things why they want you to do aerobic exercises, right? So that way it benefits the heart. And these are involving mostly your slow twitch oxidative fibers. So once again, you want to do both anaerobic and aerobic activities and you will be in better shape and you'll be healthier. So this slide is just listing the importance of exercise, and I think it's pretty clear that what you don't use, you lose, especially when it comes to skeletal muscle tissue. Uh, muscles become flaccid when we don't use that muscle for days or weeks, and that means they become untoned, uh, they become weaker. Muscle fibers start to break down the proteins, those myofibrils, therefore the muscle cells become smaller and weaker. And with prolonged inactivity, Fibrous tissue may even replace muscle fibers. So in other words, those collagen uh, fibers, that replaces skeletal muscle tissue. And unfortunately, that is irreversible. So let's now discuss some muscle disorders and diseases. So we begin with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a degenerative disease that affects muscle tissue, both skeletal muscle tissue and cardiac muscle tissue, that causes these muscles to weaken. The reason for this is because there's a mutation in the DMD gene. Now, normally, the DMD gene encodes for the protein dystrophin. So what happens in these individuals, because there's a mutation in this gene, then the muscle tissue is unable to produce dystrophin. And the result of that is the muscle cells become weak. Because if you remember, dystrophin is important for the stabilization of muscle. So therefore, the muscle becomes weak and eventually dies. So in its place, what we find is scar tissue. So you start to find fibrous tissue because, again, the muscle tissues have died. Unfortunately, there is no cure, so it is fatal, with a person eventually dying around the age of 20 to 25. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is more common in males. And the reason for that is because the DMD gene is located on the X chromosome. The next type of muscle disorder or disease is fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia is more common in females. It is idiopathic, meaning they don't know what causes it. They suspect that maybe perhaps it's overactive nerves. It is a chronic disorder that's characterized by widespread musculoskeletal pain. So the muscle aches, uh, the muscle feels fatigue, the joints ache, and there is overall fatigue. Uh, the person feels very tired. There's also localized tenderness. The last muscle disorder and disease that we're going to talk about is myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder. And what that is, is basically the person's own immune system, for whatever reason, begins attacking and destroying those acetylcholine receptors that are found on the motor end plate. And we know how important acetylcholine is as far as muscle contraction. So even if the somatic motor neuron exocytoses all that acetylcholine, acetylcholine has nowhere to go. There is no receptor at the motor end plate. Therefore, the skeletal muscle tissue cannot contract. So what's often seen are drooping eyelids, the person has difficulty swallowing and talking. And this too has no cure. The last thing I just want to mention is Botox. So Botox is utilized by the cosmetic industry. And this is a neurotoxin. It's a toxin produced by the bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. And when injected to skeletal muscle, the somatic motor neurons that supplies or that controls those skeletal muscle cells are unable to exocytose acetylcholine. So even if the nerve action potential arrives at the synaptic end knob, it's unable to release or exocytose acetylcholine. So therefore, skeletal muscle tissue cannot contract. So this concludes the presentation or the lecture videos of muscle tissue and physiology. So I hope you found these videos helpful.